Chapter Eighteen of The Long Shadow by B. M. Bower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Chapter Eighteen, When the North Wind Blows. November came in with a blizzard, one of those sudden sweeping whirls of snow with bitter cold and wind that drove fine snow flour through shack walls and around window casings and made one look speculatively at the supply of fuel it was such a storm as brings an aftermath of sheep herders reported missing with their bands scattered and wandering aimlessly or else frozen a huddled mass in some washout such a storm as sends the range cattle drifting heads down and bodies hunched together neither knowing nor caring where their trail may lead so they need not face that bitter drive of wind and snow it was the first storm of the season and they told one another it would be the worst the double crank wagons were on the way in with a bunch of bawling calves and cows when it came and they were forced to camp hastily in the shelter of a coulee till it was over and to walk and lead their horses much of the time on guard that they might not freeze in the saddle but they pulled through it and they got to the ranch and the corrals with only a few calves left beside the trail to mark their bitter passing in the first days of cold and calm that came after, the ranch was resonant day and night with that monotonous, indescribable sound, like nothing else on earth unless it be the beating of surf against a rocky shore, the bawling of nine hundred calves pinned in corrals, their uproar but the nucleus for the protesting clamor of nine hundred cows circling outside or standing with noses pressed close against the corral rails not one day and night it lasted nor two for four days the uproar showed no sign of ever lessening and on the fifth the eighteen hundred voices were so hoarse that the calves merely whispered their plaint gave over in disgust and began nosing the scattered piles of hay the cows urged by hunger strayed from the blackened circle around the corrals and went to burrowing in the snow for the ripened grass whereby they must live through the winter they were driven forth to the open range and left there and the double crank settled down to comparative quiet in what peace they might attain half the crew rolled their beds and rode elsewhere to spend the winter returning like the meadow larks with the first hint of soft skies and green grass jim bleeker and a fellow they called spikes moved over to the bridger place with as many calves as the hay there would feed and two men were sent down to the line camp to winter two were kept at the double crank ranch to feed the calves and make themselves generally useful the quietest best boys of the lot they were because they must eat in the house and billy was thoughtful of the women so the double crank settled itself for the long winter and what it might bring of good or ill billy was troubled over more things than one he could not help seeing that flora was worrying a great deal over her father and that the relations between herself and mamma joy were to put it mildly and tritely strained with the shadow of what sorrow might be theirs hidden away from them in the frost prisoned north there was no dancing to lighten the weeks as they passed and the women on the rangeland are not greatly given to visiting in winter the miles between ranches are too long and too cold and uncertain so that nothing less alluring than a dance may draw them from home billy thought it a shame and that flora must be terribly lonesome it was a long time before he had more than five minutes at a stretch in which to talk privately with her then one morning he came into breakfast and saw that the chair of mamma joy was empty and flora when he went into the kitchen afterward told him with almost a relish in her tone that mrs bridger she called her that also with a relish was in bed with toothache her face is swollen on one side till she couldn't raise a dimple to save her life she announced glancing to see that the doors were discreetly closed it's such a relief when you've had to look at them for four years if i had dimples she added spitefully rattling a handful of knives and forks into the dishpan i'd plug the things with beeswax or dough or anything that i could get my hands on heavens how i hate them same here said billy with guilty fervor it was treason to one of his few principles to speak disparagingly of a woman but it was in this case a great relief 
he had never before seen flora in just this explosive state and he had never heard her say heavens somehow it also seemed to him that he had never seen her so wholly lovable he went up to her tilted her head back a little and put a kiss on the place where dimples were not that's one of the reasons why i like you so much he murmured you haven't got dimples or yellow hair or blue eyes thank the lord some of these days girlie i'm going to pick you up and run off with you her eyes as she looked briefly up at him were a shade less turbulent you'd better watch out or she will be running off with you she said and drew gently away from him there that's a hard thing to say billy boy but it isn't half as hard as and she watches me and wants to know everything we say to each other and is she stopped abruptly and turned to get hot water i know it's tough girlie charming billy considering his ignorance of women showed an instinct for just the sympathy she needed i haven't had a chance to speak to you hardly for months anything but common remarks made in public how long does the toothache last as a general thing he took down the dish towel from its nail inside the pantry door and prepared to help her she's good for today ain't she oh yes and i suppose it does hurt i ought to be sorry but i'm not i'm glad of it i wish her face would stay that way all winter she's so fussy about her look she won't put her nose out of her room till she's pretty again oh billy boy i wish i were a man well i don't billy disagreed if you was he added soberly and stayed as pretty as you are now she'd but billy could not bring himself to finish the sentence do you think it's because you're so pretty that she flora smiled reluctantly if i were a man i could swear and swear swear anyhow suggested billy encouragingly i'll show you how and father away off in klondike she said irrelevantly passing over his generous offer and and dead for all we know and she doesn't care at all she sympathy is good but it has a disagreeable way of bringing all one's troubles to the front rather overwhelmingly flora suddenly dropped a plate back into the pan leaned her face against the wall by the sink and began to cry in a tempestuous manner rather frightened charming billy boyle who had never before seen a grown woman cry real tears and sob like that he did what he could he put his arms around her and held her close and patted her hair and called her girly and laid his brown cheek against her wet one and told her to never mind and that it would all be all right anyhow and that her father was probably picking away in his mind right then and wishing she was there to fry his bacon for him i wish i was too she murmured weaned from her weeping and talking into his coat if i'd known how she really was i wouldn't ever have stayed i'd have gone with father and where would i come in he demanded selfishly and so turned the conversation still further from her trouble the water went stone cold in the dishpan and the fire died in the stove so that the frost spread a film over the thawed center of the window panes there's no telling when the dishes would have been washed that day if mamma joy had not begun to pound energetically upon the floor with the heel of a shoe judging from the sound even that might not have proved a serious interruption but dill put his head in from the dining room and got as far as that gray horse william before he caught the significance of flora perched on the knee of william and retreated hastily so flora went to see what mamma joy wanted and billy hurried somewhat guiltily out to find what was the matter with the gray horse and practical affairs once more took control after that billy considered himself an engaged young man he went back to his ditty and inquired frequently and she make a pumpkin pie billy boy billy boy and was very nearly the old carefree charming billy of the line camp it is true that mamma joy recovered disconcertingly that afternoon and became once more ubiquitous but billy felt nothing could cheat him of his joy and remained cheerful under difficulties 
he could exchange glances of much secret understanding with flora and he could snatch a hasty kiss now and then and when the chaperonage was too unremitting she could slip into his hands a hurriedly penciled note filled with important nothings which made a bright spot in his life and kept flora from thinking altogether of her father and fretting for some news of him still there were other things to worry him and to keep him from forgetting that the law of nature which he had before defined to his own satisfaction still governed the game storm followed storm with a monotonous regularity that was to say the least depressing though to be sure there had been other winters like this and not even billy could claim that nature was especially malignant but with brown's new fence stretching for miles to the south and east of the open range near home the drifting cattle brought up against it during the blinding blizzards and huddled there freezing in the open or else plodded stolidly along beside it until some washout or coulee too deep for crossing barred their way so that the huddling and freezing was at best merely postponed billy being quite alive to the exigencies of the matter rode and rode and with him rode dill and the other two men when they had leisure which was not often since the storms made much shoveling of hay necessary if they would keep the calves from dying by the dozen they pushed the cattle away from the fences to speak figuratively and colloquially and drove them back to the open range until the next storm or cold north wind came and compelled them to repeat the process if billy had had unlimited opportunity for love-making he would not have had the time for he spent hours in the saddle every day unless the storm was too bitter even for him to face there was the line camp with which to keep in touch he must ride often to the bridger place or he thought he must to see how they were getting on it worried him to see how large the hospital bunch was growing and to see how many dark little mounds dotted the hollows except when a new fallen blanket of snow made them white the carcasses of the calves that had laid em down already you ain't feedin heavy enough boys he told them once before he quite realized how hard the weather was for stock you better ride around the hill and take a look at the stacks suggested jim bleeker we're feedin heavy as we dare bill if we don't get a let up early we're gonna be plumb out of hay there ain't been a week altogether that the calves could feed away from the sheds that's where the trouble lays billy rode the long half mile up the coulee to where the hay had mostly been stacked and came back looking sober there's no use splitting the bunch and taking some to the double crank he said we need all the hay we got over there shove em out on the hills and make em feed a little every day that's fit and bank up them sheds and make em warmer this winter's going to be one of our old steadies the way she acts so far it's sure a fright the way this weather eats up the hay it was such incidents as these which weaned him again from his singing and his light-heartedness as the weeks passed coldly toward spring he did not say very much about it to dill because he had a constitutional aversion to piling up agony ahead of him besides dill could see for himself that the loss would be heavy though just how heavy he hadn't the experience with which to estimate as march came in with a blizzard and went a succession of bleak days into april billy knew more than he cared to admit even to himself he would lie awake at night where the wind and snow raved over the land and picture the bare open that he knew with lean double crank stock drifting tail to the wind he could fancy them coming up against this fence and that fence which had not been there a year or two ago and huddling there freezing cut off from the sheltered coolies that would have saved them damn those nesters and their fences he would grit his teeth at his helplessness and then try to forget it all and think only of flora end of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the long shadow by b m bower this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by tom penn chapter nineteen i'm not your wife yet billy coming back from the biggest town in the country where he had gone to pick up another man or two for the round-up which was at hand met the pilgrim face to face as he was crossing the creek to go to the corrals 
it was nearing sundown and it was sunday and those two details when used in connection with the pilgrim seemed unpleasantly significant besides billy was freshly antagonistic because of something he had heard while he was away instead of returning the pilgrim's brazenly cheerful hello he scowled and rode on without giving so much as a downward tilt to his chin for charming billy boyle was never inclined to diplomacy or to hiding his feelings in any way unless driven to it by absolute necessity when he went into the house he saw that flora had had her hair done in a new way that was extremely pretty and that she had on a soft white silk shirtwaist with lots of lace zigzagged across a waist hitherto kept sacred to dances and other glorious occasions and a soft pink bow pinned in her hair all these things he mentally connected with the visit of the pilgrim when he turned to see a malicious light in the round blue eyes of mamma joy and a spiteful satisfaction in her very dimples it suddenly occurred to him that he would certainly have something to say to miss flora it was no comfort to know that all winter the pilgrim had not been near because all winter he had been away somewhere rumor had it that he spent his winters in iowa like the birds he always returned with the spring billy never suspected that mamma joy read his face and left them purposely together after supper though he was surprised when she arose from the table and said flora you make billy help you with the dishes i've got a headache and i'm going to lie down at any rate it gave him the opportunity he wanted are you going to let the pilgrim hang around here this summer he demanded in his straight from the shoulder fashion while he was drying the first cup you mean mr wallen i didn't know he ever hung around flora was not meek and billy realized that as he put it mentally he had his work cut out for him to pull through without a quarrel i mean the pilgrim and i call it hanging around when a fella keeps running to see a girl that's got a loop on her already i don't want to lay down the law to you girlie but that blame siwash has got to keep away from here he ain't fit for you to speak to and i'd have told you before only i didn't have any right are you sure you have a right now the tone of flora was sweet and calm and patient i'll tell you one thing charming billy boyle mr walland has never spoken one word against you he likes you and i don't think it's nice for you likes me like hell he does snorted billy not bothering to choose nice words he'd plug me in the back like an engine if he thought he could get off with it i remember him when i hazed him away from the line camp that morning after you stayed there he promised faithful to kill me course he won't cause he's afraid but i don't reckon you can call it likin why did you haze him away as you call it billy and kill his dog it was a nice dog i love dogs and i don't see how any man billy flushed hotly i hazed him away cause he insulted you he said bluntly not quite believing in her ignorance flora her hands buried deep in the soap suds looked at him round-eyed i never heard of that before she said slowly when billy and what did he say billy stared at her i don't know what he said i wouldn't think you'd need to ask when i came in the cabin i lied about getting lost from the trail i turned around and came back cause i was afraid he might come before i could get back and when i come in there was something i could tell all right you sat there behind the table looking like you was well kind of cornered and he was flora he did say something or do something he didn't act right to you i could tell didn't he you needn't be afraid to tell me girlie i give him a thrashing for it what was it i want to know he did not realize how pugnacious was his pose but he was leaning towards her with his face quite close and his eyes were blue points of intensity his hands doubled and pressed hard on the table showed white at the knuckles flora rattled the dishes in the pan and laughed unsteadily go to work billy boy and don't act stagey she commanded lightly i'll tell you the exact truth and that isn't anything to get excited over fred wallen came about three minutes before you did and of course i didn't know he belonged there 
I was afraid. He pushed open the door, and he was swearing a little at the ice there, where we threw out the dishwater. I knew it wasn't you, and I got back in the corner. He came in and looked awfully stunned at seeing me, and said, I beg your pardon, fair one. She blushed and did not look up. He said, I didn't know there was a lady present, and put down the sack of stuff and looked at me for a minute or two without saying a word. He was just going to speak, I think, when you burst in. And that's all there was to it, Billy boy. I was frightened because I didn't know who he was, and he did stare. But so did you, Billy boy, when I opened the door and walked in. You stared every bit as hard and as long as Fred Wallen did. But I'll bet I didn't have the same look in my face. You wasn't scared of me, Billy asserted shrewdly. I was, too. I was horribly scared, at first. So if you fought Fred Walland and killed his dog, the reproach of her tone then, because you imagined a lot that wasn't true, you ought to go straight and apologize. I don't think I will. Good Lord, Flora. You think I don't know the stuff he's made of? He's a low-down, cowardly cur. The kind of man that is always bragging about Billy stuck there. With her big, innocent eyes looking up at him, he could not say, bragging about the women he's ruined. So he changed weakly. About all he's done. He's a murderer that ought by rights to be in the pen right now. I think that will do, Billy, she interrupted indignantly. You know he couldn't help killing that man. I kind of believe that, too, till I run across Jim Johnson up in Tower. You don't know Jim, but he's a straight man and wouldn't lie. You remember, Flora, the pilgrim told me the Swede pulled a knife on him. I stooped down and looked, and I didn't see no knife, nor gun either. And I wasn't so blamed excited I'd be apt to pass up anything like that. I've seen men shot before, and pass out with their boots on in more excitable ways than a little plain old killing, so I didn't see anything in the shape of a weapon. But when I come back, here lays a Colt forty-five right in plain sight, and the pilgrim saying, he pulled a gun on me, right on top of telling me it was a knife. I thought at the time there was something queer about it, and about him not having a gun on him when I know he always pack one, like every other fool pilgrim that comes west with the idea he's got to fight his way along from breakfast to supper and sleep with his six-gun under his pillow. And I know you don't like him, and you'd think he had some ulterior motive if he rolled his cigarette backwards once. I don't see anything but just your dislike trying to twist things. Well, hold on a minute. I got to talking with Jim, and we're pretty good friends. So he told me on the quiet that Gus Venstrom gave him his gun to keep that night. Gus was drinking and said he didn't want to be packing it around for fear he might get foolish with it. Jim had it. Jim was tending bar that time in that little log saloon in Hardup when the Swede was killed. So it wasn't the Swede's gun on the ground. And if he borrowed one, which he wouldn't be apt to do, why didn't the fellow he got it from claim it? And if all this is true, why didn't your friend come and testify at the hearing? demanded Flora, her eyes glowing. It sounds to me exactly like a piece of spiteful old woman gossip, and I don't believe a word of it. Jim ain't a gossip. He kept his mouth shut because he didn't want to make trouble, and he was under the impression the Swede had borrowed a gun somewhere. Being half drunk, he could easily forget what he'd done with his own, and the pilgrim put up such a straight story. Fred told the truth. I know he did. I don't believe he had a gun that night, because because I had asked him as a favor to please not carry one to dances and places. There now, he'd do what I'd ask him to. I know he would. And I think you're just mean to talk like this about him. And mind you, if he wants to come here, he can. I don't care if he comes every day. She was so near to tears that her voice broke, and kept her from saying more that was foolish. And I tell you, if he come around here any more, I'll chase him off the ranch with a club. Billy's voice was not as loud as usual, 
but it was harsh and angry. He ain't going to come here hanging around you, not while I can help it. And I guess I can, all right. He threw down the dish towel, swept a cup off the table with his elbow when he turned, and otherwise betrayed human, unromantic rage. Damn him. I wish I'd chased him off long ago. Fred, eh? Hell, I'll Fred him. You think I'm going to stand for him running after my girl? I'll kick him off the place. He ain't fit to speak to you, or look at you. His friendship is insult to any decent woman. Almighty quick put a stop to him. Will Boyle, you don't dare. I'm not your wife yet, remember. I'm free to choose my own friends without asking leave of anyone. And if I want Fred Walland to come here, he'll come. And it will take more than you to stop him. I... I'll write him a note and ask him to dinner next Sunday. I, I'll i marry him if I want to, Will Boyle, and you can't stop me. He, he wants me to, badly enough, and if you... Billy was gone, and the kitchen was rattling with the slam of the door behind him before she had time to make any more declarations that would bring repentance afterward. She stood a minute, listening to see whether he would come back, and when he did not, she ran to the door, opened it hastily, and looked. She saw Billy just in the act of swishing his quirt down on the flanks of Barney, so that the horse almost cleared the creek in one bound. Flora caught her breath and gave a queer little sob. She watched him, wide-eyed and white, till he was quite out of sight, and then went in and shut the door upon the quiet, early spring twilight. As for Billy, he was gone to find the pilgrim. Just what he would do when he did find him was not quite plain, because he was promising himself so many deeds of violence that no man could possibly perform all upon one victim. At the creek, he was going to shoot him like a coyote. A quarter of a mile further, he would beat his damn head off. And as if those were not deaths sufficient, he was after that determined to take him by the heels and snap his measly head off like you would a grass snake. Threatened as he was, the pilgrim nevertheless escaped, because Billy did not happen to come across him before his rage had cooled to reason. He rode on to Hardup, spent the night there swallowing more whiskey than he had drunk before in six months, and after that playing poker with a recklessness that found a bitter satisfaction in losing and thus proving how vilely the world was using him, and went home rather unsteadily at sunrise and slept heavily in the bunkhouse all that day. For Billy Boyle was distressingly human in his rages, as in his happier moods, and was not given to gentle, picturesque melancholy, and to wailing at the silent stars. End of chapter 19Chapter 20 of The Long Shadow by B. M. Bower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Chapter 20 The Shadow Lies Long. What time he was compelled to be in the house in the few remaining days before roundup, he avoided Flora or was punctiliously polite. Only once did he address her directly by name, and then he called her Miss Bridger with a stiff formality that made Mama Joy dimple with spiteful satisfaction. Flora replied by calling him Mr. Boyle, and would not look at him. Then it was all in the past, and Billy was out on the range, learning afresh how sickeningly awry one's plans may go. As mile after mile of smiling grassland was covered by the sweep of the double-crank circles, the disaster pressed more painfully upon him. When the wagons had left the range the fall before, Billy had estimated roughly eight or nine thousand head of double crank stock wandered at will in the open. But with the gathering and the calf branding, he knew that number had shrunk woefully. Of the calves he had left with their mothers in the fall, scarce one remained. Of the cows themselves, he could find not half, and the calf branding was becoming a grim joke among the men. Eat hearty, they would sometimes banter one another. We got to buckle down and work this afternoon. There's three calves milling around out there waiting to be branded. Ah, come off. There ain't but two, another would bellow. 
If it were not quite as bad as that, it was in all conscience bad enough, and when they swung up to the reservation line and found there a fence in the making, and saw Indian cowboys at work throwing out all but reservation stock, Billy mentally threw up his hands and left the outfit in Jim Bleeker's charge while he rode home to consult Dill. For Billy Boyle, knowing well his range lore, could see nothing before the double crank but black failure. It begins to look, Dilly, he began, as though I stuck you on this game. You staked the wrong player. You should have backed the man that stacked the deck on me. There's hell to pay on the range, Dilly. Last winter sure put a crimp on the range stuff. That's what I come to tell you. I knew it cut into the bunch. I could tell by the way things was going close around here. But I didn't look for it to be as bad as it is. And they're fencing in the reservation this spring. That cuts off a big chunk of mighty good grazing and winter shelter along all them creeks. And I see there's quite a bunch of grangers come in since I was along east of here. They got cattle turning on the range, and there's half a dozen shacks scattered. Mr. Brown is selling off tracts of land with water rights, under that big ditch, you understand. He's working a sort of colonization scheme, as near as I can find out. He is also fencing more land to the north and west, toward Hardup, in fact. I believe they already have most of the posts set. We'll soon be surrounded, William. And while we're upon the subject of our calamities, I might state that we shall not be able to do any irrigating this season. Mr. Brown is running his ditch half full and has been for some little time. He kindly leaves enough for our stock to drink, however. Charitable old cuss, that same Brown. I was figuring on the hay to kind of ease through next winter. Do you know, Dilly, the range is just going to be a death trap with all them damn fences for the stock to drift into. Another winter half as bad as the last one was will put the finishing touches to the double crank, unless we get busy and do something. Billy, his face worn and his eyes holding that tired look, which comes of nights sleepless and looking long upon trouble, turned and began to pull absently at a splintered place in the gatepost. He had stopped Dell at the corral to have a talk with him, because to him the house was as desolate as if a dear one lay dead inside. Flora was at home, trust his eyes to see her face appear briefly at the window when he rode up, but he could not yet quite endure to face her in her cold greeting. Dill, looking to Billy longer and lanker and more melancholy than ever, caressed his chin meditatively and regarded Billy in his wistful, half-deprecating way. With the bitter knowledge that his cattle, and with it Dill's fortune, was toppling, Billy could hardly bear to meet that look. And he had planned such great things, and had meant to make Dilly a millionaire. "'What would you advise, William, under the present unfavorable conditions?' asked Dill hesitatingly. "'Oh, I don't know. I've laid awake nights trying to pick a winning card. If it was me and me alone, I'd pull stakes and hunt another range, and I'd go gunning after the first damn man that stuck up a post to hang barbed wire on. But after me making such a rotten poor job of running the double crank, I don't feel called on to lay down the law to anybody. If you will permit me to pass judgment, William, I will say that you have shown an ability for managing men and affairs which I consider remarkable quite remarkable. You, perhaps, do not go deep enough in searching for the cause of our misfortunes. It is not bad management, or the hard winter, or Mr. Brown, even. And I blame myself bitterly for failing to read or write the handwriting on the wall, to quote scripture, which I seldom do. If you have ever read history, William, you must know, even if you have not read history, you should know from observation, how irresistible is the march of progress, how utterly futile it is for individuals to attempt to defy it. I should have known that a shadow of a great change has fallen on the West, the West of the wide open ranges and the cattle and the cowboy who tends them. 
I should have seen it, but I did not. I was culpably careless. Brown saw it, and that, William, is why he sold the double crank to me. He saw that the range was doomed, and instead of being swallowed with the open range, he very wisely changed his business. He became allied with progress, and he was in the front rank. While we were being broken on the wheel of evolutionary change, he will make his millions. Damn him, gritted Billy savagely under his breath. He is to be admired, William. Such a man is bound in the very nature of things to succeed. It is the range, and... And you, William, and those like you, that must go. It is hard. No doubt it is extremely hard. But it is as irresistible as... as death itself. Civilization is compelled to crush the old order of things that it may fertilize the soil out of which grows the new. It is so in plant life and in the life of humans also. I am explaining at length, William, so that you will quite understand why I do not think it is wise to follow your suggestion. As I say, it is not brown or the fences or anything of that sort, taken in a large sense, which is forcing us to the wall. It is the press of natural progress, the pushing further and further of civilization. We might move to a more unsettled portion of the country and delay for a time the ultimate crushing. We could not avoid it entirely. We might, at best, merely postpone it. My idea is to gather everything and sell for as high a price as possible. Then, perhaps, it would be well to follow Mr. Brown's example and turn this place into a farm. Or sell it also and try something else. What do you think, William? But Billy, his very soul sickening under the crushing truth of what Dill in his prim grammatical way was saying, did not answer at all. He was picking blindly, mechanically at the splinter, his face shaded by his worn gray hat, and he was thinking irrelevantly how a condemned man must feel when they come to him in his cell and in formal words read out his death warrant. One sentence was beating monotonously in his brain. It is the range, and you, William, and those like you, that must go. It was not a mere loss of dollars, or of cattle, or even of hopes. It was the rending, the tearing from him of a life he loved. It was the taking of the rangeland, the wide, beautiful, weather-worn land, big and grand in its freedom of all that was narrow and sordid. And it was cutting and scarring it harnessing it to the petty uses of a class he despised with all the frank egotism of a man who loves his own outlook, giving it over to the nester and the rube, and burying sweet-smelling grasses with plows. It was, he could not, even in the eloquence of his utter despair, find words for all it meant to him. I should, of course, leave the details to you, so far as getting the most out of the stock is concerned. I have been thinking of this for some little time, and your report of range conditions merely confirms my own judgment. If you think we would better sell at once... I let it go till fall, said Billy lifelessly, snapping the splinter back into place and reaching absently for his tobacco and papers. They're bound to pick up a lot and what's left is mostly big husky steers that'll make prime beef. With decent prices, you ought to pull clear of what you owe Brown, and have a little left. I didn't make anything like I count. They was so thin I handled them as light as I could, and get the calves branded, what few there was. But I feel tolerable safe in saying you can round up six, well, between six and seven thousand a head. At a fair price, you ought to pull clear. Well, after dinner... I can't stay for dinner, Dilly. I... there's... I got to ride over here a piece. I'll catch up a fresh hoss and start right off. I... He went rather hurriedly after his rope, as hurriedly caught the horse that was handiest, and rode away at a lope. But he did not go so very far. He just galloped over the open range to a place where... Look where he might, he could not see a fence or sign of habitation, 
and it wrung the heart of him that he must ride into a coulee to find such a place got down from his horse and lay a long long while in the grass with his hat pulled over his face for the first time in years the fourth of july saw billy in camp and in his old clothes he had not hurried the round-up on the contrary he had been guilty of dragging it out unnecessarily by all sorts of delays and leisurely methods simply because he hated to return to the ranch and be near flora the pilgrim he meant to settle with but he felt that he could wait he hadn't much enthusiasm even for a fight these days but after all he could not consistently keep the wagons forever on the range so he camped them just outside the pasture fence which was far enough from the house to give him some chance of not being tormented every day by the sight of her and yet was close enough for all practical purposes and here it was that dill came with fresh news beef is falling again william he announced when he had billy quite to himself judging from present indications it will go quite as low as last fall even lower perhaps if it does i fail to see how we can ship with any but disastrous financial results well what you gonna do then billy spoke more irritably than would have been possible a year ago you can't winter again and come out with anything but another big loss you haven't even got hay to feed what few calves there is and as i told you the way the fences are strung from hell to breakfast the stock's bound to die off like poison flies every storm that comes i have kept that in mind william i saw that i should be quite unable to make a payment this fall so i went to mr brown to make what arrangements i could to be brief william brown has offered to buy back this place and the stock on much the same terms he offered me i believe he wants to put this section of land under irrigation from his ditch and exploit it with the rest the cattle he can turn into his immense fields until they can be shipped at a profit however that is not our affair and need not concern us he will take the stock as they run at twenty one dollars a head if as you estimate there are somewhere in the neighborhood of six thousand that will clear me of all indebtedness and leave a few thousand with which to start again at something more abreast of the times i hope i am rather inclined to take the offer what do you think of it william i guess you can't do any better twenty one dollars a head as they run and everything else thrown in of course that is the way i bought it yes said dill well we ought to scare up six thousand if we can't close i know old brown fine he'll hold you right down to what you turn over and he'll tally so close he'll want to dock you if a critter shy one horn damn him that's why i was wishing you'd bought that way instead of lumping the price and taking chances only of course i knew just about what was on the range then i will accept the offer i have been merely considering it until i saw you and perhaps it will be as well to go about it immediately it's plenty early objected billy i was going to break some more hosses for the saddle bunch but i reckon i'll leave em now for brown to bust and for god's sake dilly once you get wound up here go on back to where you come from if the range is going and there's no use saying it ain't this ain't going to be no place for any white man which was merely billy's prejudice speaking end of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of the long shadow by b m bower this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Chapter 21. The End of the Double Crank. Dill himself rode on that last roundup. Considering that it was all new to him, he made a remarkably good record for himself among the men, who were more than once heard to remark that Dill Pickle's sure making a hand. Wherever Billy went, and in those weeks billy rode and worked with a feverish intensity that was merely a fight against bitter thinking dill's stirrup clacked close alongside he was silent for the most part but sometimes he talked reminiscently of michigan and his earlier life there seldom did he refer to the unhappy end of the double crank or to the reason why they were riding from dawn to dusk 
sweeping together all the cattle within the wide circle of riders and later cutting out every double-crank animal and holding them under a careful herd. Even when they went with the first 1,200 and turned them over to Brown and watched his careful counting, Dill made no comment upon the reason for it beyond one sentence. He read the receipt over slowly before laying it methodically in the proper compartment of his long red leather book and drew his features into his puckered imitation of a smile. Mr. Brown has counted just twenty-one dollars more into my pocket than I expected, he remarked. He tallied one more than you did, William. I ought to hold that out of your wages, young man. Rare as were Dill's efforts at joking, even this failed to bring more than a slight smile to the face of charming Billy Boyle. He was trying to look upon it all as a mere incident, a business matter, pure and simple, but he could not. While he rode the wide open reaches, there rode with him the keen realization that it was the end. For him, the old life on the range was dead, for had not Dill made him see it so? And did not every raw red fence post proclaim anew its death? For every hill and every coulee he buried something of his past and wept secretly beside the grave. For every whiff of breakfast that mingled with the smell of clean air in the morning came a pang of homesickness for what would soon be only a memory. He was at heart a dreamer, was charming Billy Boyle. Perhaps an idealist, possibly a sentimentalist. He had never tried to find a name for the side of his life that struck deepest. He knew that the ripple of a meadow lark swinging on a weed against the sunrise, with diamond sparkles all on the grass around, gripped him and hurt him vaguely with its very sweetness. He knew that he loved to sit alone and look away to a far skyline and daydream. He had always known that, for it had been as much a part of his life as sleeping. So now it was as if a real, tangible shadow lay on the range. He could see it always lengthening before him, and always he must ride within its shade. After a while it would grow quite black, and the range and the cattle and the riding over hills and into coolies untamed would all be blotted out, dead and buried deep in the past, and with the careless, plodding feet of the plowman trampling unthinkingly upon the grave. It was a tragedy to charming Billy Boyle. It was as if the rangeland were a woman he loved well, and as if civilization were the despoiler, against whom he had no means of defense. All this, and besides, Flora. He had not spoken to her for two months. He had not seen her even, save for a passing glimpse now and then at a distance. He had not named her to any man, or asked how she did and yet there had not been an hour when he had not longed for her. She had told him she would marry the pilgrim. She had not said that, but Billy in his rage had so understood her, and that he could not stop her. He wouldn't try to stop her, but he would one day settle with the pilgrim, settle to the full. And he wanted her, wanted her. They had taken the third herd in to Brown, and were back on the range, Billy meaning to make a last sweep around the outer edges and gather in what was left, the stragglers that had been missed before. There would not be many, he knew from experience, probably not more than a hundred or two all told, even with Billy anxious to make the count as large as possible. He was thinking about it uneasily and staring out across the wide coulee to the red tumble of clouds that had strange purples and grays and dainty violet shades here and there. Down at the creek, Dill was trying to get a trout or two more before it grew too dark for them to rise to the raw beef he was swishing through the riffle, and the impulse to have the worst over at once and be done drove Billy down to interrupt. "'You won't get any more there,' he said by way of making speech. "'I just then had a bite, William,' reproved Dill, and swung the bait in a wide circle for another awkward cast. He was a persistent soul, was Dill." when once he got started in a given direction. Billy, dodging the red morsel of meat, sat down on a grassy hummock. "'Ah, oh, come and sit down, Dilly,' he urged wearily. "'I want to tell you something.' "'If it's about the cook being out of evaporated cream, William, I have already been informed twice. Ah, I almost had one then.' "'Ah, oh, thunder! You think I'm worrying over canned cream?' 
What I want to say may not be more important, but when you get fishing enough, I'll say it anyhow. He watched Dill moodily, and then lifted his eyes to stare at the gorgeous sky, as though there would be no more sunsets when the range life was gone, and he must needs fill well his memory for the barren years ahead. When Dill flopped a six-inch trout against his ear, so steep was he in bitterness that he merely said, Ah, oh, hell, wearily, and hunched further along on the hummock. I really beg your pardon, William. From the vicious strike he made, I was convinced that he weighed at least half a pound, and exerted more muscular force than was quite necessary. When one hasn't a reel, it is impossible to play them properly, and it is the first quick pull that one must depend upon. I am very sorry. Sure. Don't mention it, Dilly. Say, how many cattle have you got receipts for to date, if it ain't too much trouble? No trouble at all, William. I have an excellent memory for figures. Four thousand three hundred and fifteen. Ah, see how instinct inspires him to flop always towards the water? Did you ever? Well, yes, I've saw a fish flop towards the water once or twice before now. It sure is a great sight, Dilly. He did not understand Dill these days, and wondered a good deal at his manifest indifference to business cares. It never occurred to him that Dill, knowing quite well how hard the trouble pressed upon his foreman, was only trying in his awkward way to lighten it by not seeming to think it worth worrying over. I uh, hate to mention trifles at such a time, Dilly, but I thought maybe you ought to know that we won't be able to scare up more than a couple hundred more cattle. Best we can do. We're bound to fall a lot short of what I estimated, and I ain't saying nothing about the fine job of guessing I'd done. If we bring the total up to forty-five hundred, we'll do well. Dill took plenty of time to wind the line around the willow pole. To use your own expressive phraseology, William, he said when he had quite finished and had laid the pole down on the bank, that will leave me in one hell of a hole. That's what I thought. "'Billy returned apathetically. "'Well, I must take these up to the cook,' "'Dill held up the four fish he had caught. "'I'll think the matter over, William, "'and I thank you for telling me. "'Of course you will go on and gather what there are.' "'Sure,' agreed Billy tonelessly, "'and followed Dill back to camp and went to bed. "'At daybreak it was raining, "'and Billy, after the manner of cowboys, slept late, "'for there would be no riding until the weather cleared.' and there being no herd to hold, there would be none working save the horse wrangler, the night hawk, and the cook. It was the cook who handed him a folded paper and a sealed envelope when he did finally appear for a cup of coffee. Dill Pickle left him for you, he said. Billy read the note, just a few lines, with a frown of puzzlement. Dear William, business compels my absence for a time. I hope you will go on with your plans exactly as if I were with you. I am leaving a power of attorney which will enable you to turn over the stock and transact any other business that may demand immediate attention, in case I am detained. Yours truly, Alexander P. Dill. It was queer, but Billy did not waste much time in wondering. He rounded up the last of the double cranks, drove them to Brown's place, and turned them over with the home ranch, the horses, and camp outfit. Made a clean sweep of the whole damn hoodooed works, was the way he afterward put it. He had expected that Dill would be there to attend to the last legal forms, but there was no sign of him or from him. He had been seen to take the eastbound train at Tower, and the rest was left to guessing. He must have known them two hundred odd wouldn't square the deal, argued Billy loyally to himself. So, of course, he'll come back and fix it up. But what I'm to do about paying off the boys gets me. For two hours he worried, mentally in the dark. Then he hit upon an expedient that pleased him. He told Brown he would need to keep a few of the saddle horses for a few days, and he sent the boys, those of them who did not transfer their valuable services to Brown upon the asking, over to the Bridger place to wait there until further orders. Also, he rode reluctantly to the Double Crank Ranch, wondering as he had often done in the past few weeks, what would become of Flora and Mama Joy. So far as he knew, they had not heard a word as to whether Bridger was alive or dead, and if they had friends or family to whom they might turn, 
he had never heard either mention them. If Dill had been there, he would have left it to him. But Dill was gone, and there was no knowing when he would be back, and it devolved upon Billy to make some arrangements for the women, or, at the least, to offer his services, and it was under the circumstances quite the most unpleasant duty thus far laid upon him. He knew they had been left there at the ranch when Roundup started, because Dill had said something about leaving a gentle horse or two for them to ride. Whether they were still there he did not know, although he could easily have asked Spikes, who had been given charge of the ranch while Dill was away on the range. He supposed the pilgrim would be hanging around as usual. Not that it made much difference, though, except that he hated the thought of a disagreeable scene before the women. He rode slowly up to the corral gate, turned his horse inside, and fastened the chain, just as he had done a thousand times before, only this would be the last time. His tired eyes went from one familiar object to another, listlessly aware of the regret he should feel, but too utterly wearied of sorrow to feel much of anything. No one seemed to be about, and the whole place had an atmosphere of desolation that almost stirred him to a heartache. Almost. He went on to the house. There were some signs of life there, and some sound. In the very doorway he met old Bridger himself, but he could not even feel much surprise at seeing him there. He said hello, and when he saw the other's hand stretching out to meet him, he clasped it indifferently. Behind her husband, Mama Joy flashed at him a look he did not try to interpret. Of a truth, it was rather complex, with a little of several emotions and he lifted his hat a half inch from his forehead, in deference to her sex. Flora, he thanked God dully, he did not see at all. He stayed perhaps ten minutes listening impersonally to Bridger, who talked loudly and enthusiastically of his plans. At the time they did not seem to concern him at all, though they involved taking Flora and Mama Joy away to Seattle to spend the winter, and in the spring moving them on to some place in the north, a place that sounded strange in the ears of Billy, and was straightway forgotten. After that he went to his room and packed what few things he wanted, and there were not many, because in his present mood nothing mattered, and nothing seemed to him of much value, not even life. He was more careful of Dill's belongings, and packed everything he could find that was his. They were not scattered, for Dill was a methodical man, and kept things in their places instinctively. He paused over one object, the Essays of Elia, which had somehow fallen behind a trunk. Standing there in the middle of Dill's room, he turned the little blue book absently in his hand. There was dust upon the other side, and he wiped it off, manlike, with a sweep of his forearm. He looked at the trunk. He had just locked it with much straining of muscles, and he hated to open it again. He looked at the book again. He seemed to see Dill slump loosely down in the old rocker, a slippered foot dangling before him, reading solemnly from this same little blue book, the day he came to tell him about the ditch, that he must lease all the land he could, the day when the shadow of passing first touched the rangeland, at least the day when he had first seen it there. He turned a few leaves thoughtfully, heard Flora's voice asking a question in the kitchen, and thrust the book hastily into his pocket. Dilly'll want it, I expect, he muttered, he glanced quickly, comprehensively around him, to make sure that he had missed nothing, turned toward the open front door, and went out hurriedly, because he thought he heard a woman's step in the dining room, and he did not want to see anybody, not even Flora, least of all Flora. "'I'll send a rig out from town for the stuff that's ours,' he called back to Bridger, who came to the kitchen door, and called after him that he better wait and have some supper. "'You'll be here till tomorrow, or next day.' It ain't likely I'll be back. You say Dill settled up with the women, so there's nothing left to do. If he had known, but how could he know that Flora was watching him wistfully from the front porch when he never once looked toward the house after he reached the stable? End of chapter 21《ハッピーオーバーラッピーオーバーラッピーオーバーラッピーオーバーラッピーオーバーラッピーオーバーラッピーオーバーラッピーオーバーラッピーオーバーラッピーオーバーラッピーオーバーラッピーオーバーラッピーオーバーラッピーオーバーラッピーオーバーラッピーオーバーラッピーオーバーラッピーオーバーラッピーオーバーラッピーオーバーラッピーオーバーラッピーオーバーラッピーオーバーラッピーオーバーラッピーオ
Queerly, it was when he was rounding the low, barren hill where he and Dill had first met, he took out his brand book and went over the situation. It was Barney he rode, and Barney could be trusted to pace along decorously, with the reins twisted twice around the saddle horn. So Billy gave no thought to his horse, but put his whole mind on the figures. He was not much used to these things. Beyond keeping tally of the stock at branding and shipping time and putting down what details of his business he dared not trust to memory, a pencil was strange to his fingers. But the legal phrases in the paper left by Dill and signed by the cook and Nighthawk as witnesses gave him a heavy sense of responsibility that everything should be settled exactly right. So now he went over the figures slowly, adding them from the top down and from the bottom up to make sure he had the totals correct. He wished they were wrong. They might then be not quite so depressing. Let me see now. I turned over 4,523 head of stock, all told. Hell of a fine job of guessing I'd done. Me saying they'd be over 6,000. That made $94,983. And according to old Brown, and I guess he had it framed up correct, Dilly owes him $2,217 yet, instead of coming out with enough to start some other business. It's sure queer the way figures always come out little when you want em big and big when you want em little. Them debts now, they could stand a lot of shaving down. $12,000 in interest to the bank. I can't do a darn thing about them 12000 if Dilly hadn't gone and made a cast-iron agreement, I could have held old Brown up for a few thousand more on account of the increase in saddle stock. I'd work that bunch up till it sure was a dandy lot of horses. But what you gonna do? He stared dispiritedly out across the brown prairie. I'd oughta put Dilly next to that, only I never thought about it at the time, and I was so dead sure of the range stuff. And there's the men got to have their money right away quick, so's they can hurry up and blow it in. If Dilly ain't back tonight, or I don't hear from him, I reckon I'll have to draw my little old wad out of the bank and pay the sons of guns. I sure ain't gonna need it to buy dishes and rocking chairs and pictures. And I was gonna get her a piano. Oh, hell. He still rode slowly after that but he did not bother over the figures that stood for Dilly's debts. He sat humped over the saddle horn like an old man and stared at the trail and at the four feet of Barney coming down pluck pluck with leisurely regularity in the dust. Just so was charming Billy Boyle trampling down the dreams that had been so sweet in the dreaming and leveling ruthlessly the very foundation of the fair castle he had builded in the air for Dill and himself and one other with the fairest, highest, most secret chambers for that other. And as he rode, the face of him was worn and the blue eyes of him somber and dull, and his mouth, that had lost utterly the humorous, carefree quirk at the corners, was bitter and straight and hard. He had started out with such naive assurance to succeed, and he had failed so utterly, so hopelessly, with not even a spectacular crash to make the failing picturesque. He had done the best that was in him, and even now that it was over, he could not quite understand how everything, everything, could go like that. How the double crank and flora, how the range, even, had slipped from him. And now Dill was gone, too, and he did not even know where, or if he would ever come back. He would pay the men. He had, with a surprising thrift, saved nearly a thousand dollars in the bank at tower that to be sure was when he had flora to save for since then he had not had time or opportunity to spend it foolishly he would take nearly every dollar the way he had figured it he would have just twenty three dollars left for himself and he would have the little bunch of horses he had in his prosperity acquired for the pure love of owning a good horse he would sell the horses except barney and one to pack his bed and he would drift, drift just as do the range cattle when a blizzard strikes them in the open. Billy felt like a stray. His range was gone, gone utterly. 
he would roll his bed and drift and perhaps somewhere he could find a stretch of earth as god had left it unscarred by fence and plow undefiled by cabbages and sugar beets brown's new settlers were going strong on sugar beets well it's all over but the shoutin he summed up grimly when hardup came in sight i'll pay off the men and turn em loose all but jim somebody's got to stay with the bridger place till dilly shows up seein that's all he's got left after the clean-up the rest of the debts can wait brown's mortgage ain't due yet billy had his own way of looking at financial matters and the old siwash ain't got any kick comin if he never gets another cent out of dilly the bank ain't got the cards to call dilly now for his note ain't due till near christmas so i reckon all i gotta do after i pay the boys is take my little old twenty-three plunks and my hosses if i can't sell em right off and pull out for god knows where and i don't care a damn charming billy boyle had done all that he had planned to do except that he had not yet pulled out for the place he had named picturesquely for himself much as at the beginning he was leaning heavily upon the bar in the hard up saloon and his hat was pushed back on his head but he was not hilarious to the point of singing about the young thing and he was not to any appreciable extent enjoying himself he was merely adding what he considered the proper finishing touch to his calamities he was spinning silver dollars one by one across the bar to the man with the near white apron and he was endeavoring to get the worth of them down his throat to be sure he was being assisted now and then by several acquaintances but considering the fact that a man's stomach has certain well-defined limitations he was doing very well indeed when he had spun the twenty-third dollar to the bartender billy meant to quit drinking for the present after that he was not quite clear as to his intentions farther than forking his hoss and pulling out when there was no more to be done he felt uneasily that between his present occupation and the pulling out process lay a duty unperformed but until the door swung open just as he was crying come on fellas he had not been able to name it the pilgrim it was who entered jauntily the pilgrim who had not chanced to meet billy once during the summer and so was not aware that the truce between them was ended for good and all he knew that billy had not at any time been what one might call cordial but that last stare of displeasure when they met in the creek at the double crank he had sat down to a peevish mood under the circumstances it was natural that he should walk up to the bar with the rest under the circumstances it was also natural that billy should object to this unexpected and unwelcome guest and that the vague unperformed duty should suddenly flash into his mind clear and well defined and urgent back up pilgrim was his quiet way of making known his purpose you can't drink all my money old timer nor use a room that i'm honoring with my presence just right now i'm here it's up to you to back out a way out clean outside and across the street the pilgrim did not move billy had been drinking but his brain was not of the stuff that fuddles easily and he was not as the pilgrim believed drunk his eyes when he stared hard at the pilgrim were sober eyes sane eyes and something besides i said it he reminded softly when men had quit shuffling their feet and the room was very still i don't reckon you know what you said the pilgrim retorted laughing uneasily and shifting his gaze a bit what they been doping you with bill there ain't any quarrel between you and me no more his tone was abominably condescendingly tolerant and his look was the look which a mastiff turns wearily upon a hysterical toy terrier yapping foolishly at his knees for the pilgrim had changed much in the past year and more during which men had respected him because he was not considered quite safe to trifle with according to the reputation they gave him he had killed a man who had tried to kill him and he could therefore afford to be pacific upon occasion billy stared at him while he drew a long breath a breath which seemed to press back a tangible weight of hatred and utter contempt for the pilgrim a breath while it seemed that he must kill him there and stamp out the very semblance of humanity from his mocking face 
You don't know of any quarrel between you and me? You say you don't? Billy's voice trembled a little because of the murder lust that gripped him. Well, pretty soon I'll start in and tell you all about it, maybe. Right now I'm going to give a new one. One that you can easily name and do what you damn please about. Whereupon he did as he had done once before when the offender had been a sheep herder. He stepped quickly to one side of the pilgrim, emptied a glass down inside his collar, struck him sharply across his grinning mouth, and stepped back, back until there were eight or ten feet between them. That's the only way my whiskey will go down your neck, he said. Men gasped and moved hastily out of range, never doubting what would happen next. Billy himself knew, or thought he knew, and his hand was on his gun, ready to pull it out and shoot, hungry, waiting for an excuse to fire. The pilgrim had given a bellow that was no word at all, and whirled to come at Billy, met his eyes, wavered, and hesitated, his gun in his hand and half raised to fire. Billy, bent on giving the pilgrim a fair chance, waited another second, waited and saw fear creep into the bold eyes of the pilgrim waited and saw the inward cringing of the man. He was like striking a dog and waiting for the spring at your throat, promised by his snarling defiance, and then seeing the fire go from his eyes as he grovels, cringingly confessing you his master, himself a cur. What had been hate in the eyes of Billy changed slowly to incredulous contempt. "'Ain't that enough?' he cried disgustedly. "'My God! Ain't you man enough?' Have I got to take you by the ear and slit your gullet like they stick pigs, or else let you go? What are you anyhow? Shall I give my gun to the barkeep and go out where it's dark? Will you be scared to tackle me then? He laughed and watched the yellow terror creep over the face of the pilgrim at the taunt. What's wrong with your gun? Ain't it working good tonight? Ain't it loaded? Heavens and earth! What else have I got to do before you'll come alive? You've been living on your rep as a bad man to monkey with, and pushing out your wishbone over it for quite a spell now. Why don't you get busy and collect another bunch of admiration from these fellows? I ain't no lightning shot man. Papa Death don't roost at the end of my six-gun, or I never suspicioned before he did. But from the save-me-quick look on you, I believe you'd faint plumb away if I let you take a look at the end of my gun with the butt in toward you. Honest to God, Pilgrim, I won't try to get in ahead of you. I couldn't if I tried, cause mine's at my belt yet, and I ain't so swift. Come on, please. Purty please. Billy looked around the room and laughed. He pointed his finger mockingly. Ain't he a peach of a bad man, boys? Ain't you proud of his acquaintance? I reckon I'll have to turn my back before he'll cut loose. You know he's just aching to kill me, only he don't want me to know it when he does. He's afraid he might hurt my feelings. He swung back to the pilgrim, went close, and looked at him impertinently, his head on one side. He reached out deliberately with his hand, and the pilgrim ducked and cringed away. "'Aw, oh, look here,' he whined. "'I ain't done nothing to you, Bill.' Billy's hand dropped slowly and hung at his side. "'You damn coward,' he gritted. "'You know you won't get any more than an even break with me, and that ain't enough for you. You're afraid to take a chance. You're afraid. God!' he cried suddenly, swept out of his mockery by the rage within. And I can't kill you. You won't show nerve enough to give me a chance. You won't even fight, will you? He leaned and struck the pilgrim savagely. Get out of my sight, then. Get out of town. Get clean out of the country. Get out among the coyotes. They're near your breed than men. For every sentence there was a stinging blow a blow with the flat of his hand driving the pilgrim back step by step to the door. The pilgrim, shielding his head with an uplifted arm, turned then and bolted out into the night. Behind him were men who stood ashamed for their manhood, not caring to look straight at one another with so sickening an example before them of the craven coward a man may be. 
In the doorway, Billy stood framed against the yellow lamplight, a hand pressing hard against the casings, while he leaned and hurled curses in a voice half sobbing with rage. It was so that Dill found him when he came looking, when he reached out and laid a big knuckled hand gently on his arm. Billy shivered and stared at him in a queer, dazed fashion for a minute. Why, oh, uh, hello, Dilly, he said then, and his voice was hoarse and broken. Where the dickens have you come from? Without a word, Dill, still holding him by the arm, led him unresistingly away. End of chapter 22「Chapter twenty three of the Long Shadow by B. M. Bower. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tom Penn. Chapter twenty three. Oh, where have you been, charming Billy? Presently they were in the little room which Dill had kept for himself by the simple method of buying the shack that held it, and Billy was drinking something which Dill poured out for him and which steadied him wonderfully. If you are not feeling quite yourself, William. Perhaps we would do better to postpone our conversation until morning, Dill was saying while he rocked awkwardly, his hands folded loosely together, his elbows on the rocker arms, and his round, melancholy eyes regarding Billy solemnly. I wanted to ask how you came out with the double crank. Go ahead. I'm all right, said Billy. I'm to hit the trail by sunup, so we'll have our little say now. He made him a cigarette and looked wistfully at Dill while he felt for a match. Go ahead. What do you want to know the worst? Well, I did not see Brown, and it occurred to me that after I left, you must have gathered more stock than you anticipated. I discovered from the men that you have paid them off. I rode out there today, you know. I arrived about two hours after you had left. You're still in the hole in the cow business. Billy stated flatly, as if there were no use in trying to soften the telling. Yo Brown, two thousand odd dollars. I turned in a few over two hundred head. I got it all down here, and you can see the exact figure yourself. You didn't show up, and I didn't want to hold them in and let their time run on and nothing doing to make it pay, so I give them their money and let them off. All but Jim Bleeker. I didn't pay him because I wanted him to look after things at the Bridger place till you got back, and I knew if I gave him any money, he'd burn the earth getting to where he could spend it. He's a fine fellow when he's broke, Jim is. But I owed the men for several months' work. Where did you raise the amount, William? Dell cleared his throat raspingly. Me? Oh, I had some of my wages saved up. I used that. It never occurred to Billy that he had done anything out of the ordinary. Hmm. Dill cleared his throat again and rocked, his eyes on Billy's moody face. I observe, William, that, er, uh, they are not shipping any skates to, uh, hell yet. Huh? Billy had not been listening. I was saying, William, that I appreciate your fidelity to my interests, and... Oh, that's all right, Billy cut in carelessly. And I should like to have you with me on a new venture I have in mind. You probably have not heard of it here, but it is an assured fact that the railroad company are about to build a cutoff that will shut out tower completely and put hard up on the main line. In fact, they have actually started work at the other end, and though they are always very secretive about a thing like that, I happen to have a friend on the inside, so that my information is absolutely authentic. I have raised $50,000 among my good friends in Michigan, and I intend to start a first-class general store here. I have already bargained for ten acres of land over there on the creek, where I feel sure the main part of the town will be situated. If you will come in with me, we will form a partnership, equal shares. It has borrowed capital, he added hastily, so that I am not giving you anything, William. You will take the same risk I take, and... Sorry, Dilly, but I couldn't come through. Fine counter-jumper I'd make. Thank you all the same, Dilly. But there is the Bridger place. I shall keep that and go into thoroughbred stock. Good middleweight horses, I think, 
that will find a ready sale among the settlers who are going to flock in here. You could take charge there, and... No, Dilly, I couldn't. I... I'm thinking of drifting down into New Mexico. I... I want to see that country. Bad. Dill crossed his long legs the other way, let his hands drop loosely, and stared wistfully at Billy. I really wish I could induce you to stay, William, he murmured. Well, you can't. I hope you come through better than you did with the double crank, but I guess it'll be some considerable time before the town and the gentle farmer, damn him, are crowded to the wall by your damn progress. It was the first direct protest against changing conditions which Billy had so far put into words, and he looked sorry for having said so much. Oh, here's your little blue book, he added, feeling it in his pocket. I found it behind a trunk when everything else was packed. You saw, uh, you saw Bridger, then? He is going to take his wife and Flora up north with him in the spring. It seems he has done well. I know, he told me. Dill turned the leaves of the book slowly, and consciously refrained from looking at Billy. They were about to leave when I was there. It is a shame. I am very sorry for Flora. She does not want to go. If... He cleared his throat again and guiltily pretended to be reading a bit here and there, and to be speaking casually. If I were a marrying man, I am not sure but I should make love to Flora. Hmm? This bachelor's complaint here. Have you read it, William? It is very... Here, for instance, nothing is to me more distasteful than the entire complacency and satisfaction which beam in the countenances of a new married couple, and so on. I feel tempted sometimes when I look at Flora, only she looks upon me as a piece of furniture, the kind that sticks out in the way, and you have to feel your way around it in the dark. Awkward, but necessary. Poor girl. She cried in the most heartbroken way when I told her we would not be likely to see her again. And I wonder what is the trouble between her and Walland. They used to be quite friendly, in a way, but she has not spoken to him, to my certain knowledge, since last spring. Whenever he came to the ranch, she would go to her room and refuse to come out until he had left. Hmm? Did she ever tell you, William? No, snapped William huskily, smoking with his head bent and turned away. I know positively that she cut him dead, as they say, at the last Fourth of July dance. He asked her to dance, and she refused almost rudely, and immediately got up and danced with that boy of Gunderson's, the one with the hair lip. She could not have been taken with the hair-lipped fellow. At least, I should scarcely think so. Should you, William? This time William did not answer at all. Dill, watching his bent head tenderly, puckered his face into his peculiar smile. Hmm. They stopped at the hotel tonight. Bridger's, I mean. Drove in after dark from the ranch. They mean to catch the noon train from Tower tomorrow, Bridger told me. It will be an immense benefit, William, when those big through trains get to running through hard up. There is some talk among the powers that be of making this a division point. It will develop the country wonderfully. I really feel tempted to cut down my investment in a store, for the present, and buy more land. What do you think, William? Oh, I don't know, said Billy in a let-me-alone kind of tone. Well, it's very late. Everybody who lays any claim to respectability should be in his bed, Dill remarked placidly. You say you start at sunrise? Hmm. You'll have to call me so that I can go over to the hotel and get the money to refund what you used of your own. I left my cash in the hotel safe. But they will be stirring early. They will have to get the bridgers off, you know. It was Dill who lay and smiled quizzically into the dark and listened to the wide awake breathing of the man beside him breathing which betrayed deep emotion held rigidly in check so far as outward movement went he fell asleep knowing well that the other was lying there wide-eyed and would probably stay so until day he had had a hard day and had done many things 
but what he had done last pleased him best. Now this is a bald, unpolished record of the morning. Billy saw the dawn come, and rose in the perfect silence he had learned from years of sleeping in a tent with tired men, and of having to get up at all hours and take his turn at night guarding, for tired, sleeping cowboys do not like to be disturbed unnecessarily, and so they one and all learn speedily the golden rule and how to apply it. That is why Dill, always a light sleeper, did not hear Billy go out. Billy did not quite know what he was going to do, but Habit bade him first feed and water his horse. After that, well, he did not know. Dill might not have things straight, or he might just be trying to jolly him up a little, or he might be a meddlesome old granny gossip. What had looked dear and straight, say at three o'clock in the morning, was at day dawn hazy with doubt. So he led Barney down to the creek behind the hotel, where in that primitive little place they watered their horses. The sun was rising redly, and the hurrying ripples were all tipped with gold, and the sky above a bewildering tumbled fabric of barbaric coloring. Would the sun rise like that in New Mexico, Billy wondered, and watch the coming of his last day here, where he had lived, had loved, had dreamed dreams and builded castles, and had seen the dreams change to bitterness and the castles go toppling to ruins. He would like to stay with Dill, for he had grown fond of the lank, whimsical man, who was like no one Billy had ever known. He would have stayed, even in the face of the change that had come to the rangeland, but he could not bear to see the familiar line of low hills which marked the double crank, and further down the line camp, and know that Flora was gone quite away from him into the north. He caught himself back from brooding and gave a pull at the halter, by way of hinting to Barney that he need not drink the creek entirely dry, when suddenly he quivered and stood so still that he scarcely breathed. Oh, where have you been, Billy boy, Billy boy? Oh, where have you been, charming Billy? Someone at the top of the creek bank was singing it, someone with an exceedingly small, shaky little voice, that was trying to be daring and mocking and indifferent, and that was none of these things, but only wistful and a bit pathetic. Charming Billy, his face quite pale, turned his head cautiously as though he feared too abrupt a glance would drive her away, and looked at her standing there with her gray felt hat tilted against the sun, flipping her gloves nervously against her skirt. She was obviously trying to seem perfectly at ease, but her eyes were giving the lie to her manner. Billy tried to smile, but instead his lips quivered and his eyes blinked. I've been to see my wife, he began to sing gamely, and stuck there because something came up in his throat and squeezed his voice to a whisper. By main strength he pulled Barney away from the gold-tipped ripples and came stumbling over the loose rocks. She watched him warily, half turned ready to run away we i aren't you going to be nice and say good-bye to me he came on staring at her and saying nothing well if you still want to sulk i wouldn't be as nasty as that and and hold a grudge the way you do and i was going to be nice and forgiving but if you don't care and don't want by this time he was close quite close you know i care and you know i want you oh girly girly the colors had all left the sky save blue and silver gray and the sun was a commonplace dazzling ball of yellow charming billy boyle his hat set back upon his head at a most eloquent angle led barney from the creek up to the stable his eyes were alight and his brow was unwrinkled his lips had quite lost their bitter lines and once more had the humorous carefree quirk at the corners. He slammed the stable door behind him and went off down the street, singing exultantly, I've been to see my wife, she's the joy of my life. He jerked open the door of the shack, gave a whoop to raise the dead, and took Dill ungently by the shoulder. Come alive, you seven-foot Dill Pickle. What you want to lay here snoring for at this time of day? Don't you know it's morning? 
Dill sat up and blinked, much like an owl in the sunshine. He puckered his face into a smile. Aren't you rather uproarious for so early in the day, William? I was under the impression that one usually grew hilarious. Oh, there's other things besides whiskey to make a man feel good, grinned Billy, his cheeks showing a tinge of red. I'm in a hurry, Dilly. I got to hit the trail immediate, and if it ain't too much trouble to let me have that money you spoke about. Dill got out of bed, eyeing him shrewdly. Have you been gambling, William? Billy ran the green shade up from the window so energetically that it slipped from his fingers and buzzed noisily at file top. He craned his neck, trying to see the hotel. Maybe you'd call it that, an old bachelor like you. You see, Dilly, I got business over in Tower. I got to be there before noon, and I need... Oh, thunder. How's a man going to get married when he's only got six dollars in his jeans? I should say that would be scarcely feasible, William. Dill was smiling down at the lacing of his shoes. We can soon remedy that, however. I'm... I'm very glad, William. The cheeks of charming Billy Boyle grew quite red. And by the way, Dilly, he said hurriedly, as if he shied at the subject of his love and his marriage, I changed my mind about going to New Mexico. I... We'll settle down on the Bridger place if you still want me to. She says she'd rather stay here in this country. Dill settled himself into his clothes, went over and laid a hand awkwardly upon Billy's arm. I'm very glad, William, he said simply. The End End of Chapter 23 End of The Long Shadow by B. M. Bower